Hi, my name is Sarah Goslin. I'm a senior scientist at Pacific Northwest National Lab here in Seattle, and I'm excited to present the work that I've been doing as part of a larger proteomic cancer group uh, called decom for loot a benchmarking platform for a proteomic tumor deconvolution. So just a, as a bit of a biology background for those of you that are not in the cancer world, uh, we measure patient tumors by gene expression or protein expression, and by measuring these values, which are thousands of values per tumor, we can predict prognosis and identify drug therapies and stratify patients and so forth. However, when we measure the gene expression or protein expression of a tumor, we're actually not just measuring the tumor itself, but also measuring all of the cells that are recruited to the tumor to help support its development. And these immune cells, or primarily immune cells, um, are actually being recruited in the different ways and can be targeted by independent therapies. So if we better understand the immune cells that are being recruited to the tumor and how many are, are being recruited, what fraction of the tumor is actually immune, then we can better identify potential immunotherapies. So there have been many tools that have been developed to deconvolve tumor gene expression data uh, to better understand his immune landscape. And so this is an example from one of the earlier papers called CyberSort, and this really kind of lays out the way that the algorithms work. And essentially what they do is they take sorted cells um, where they know the specific cells of origin, the specific immune cells. I think this paper took 22 different types of immune cells. They measured the gene expression and then identified those specific genes that were uniquely expressed in each immune cell. So this creates what they call a signature matrix. And then they're able to take this signature matrix with their algorithm and deconvolve from a bulk tumor gene expression measurement here, the fractions of estimated tumors of estimated cells in each of the, in, in each tumor. And so then you get essentially, instead of just a gene expression value for each tumor, you actually get um, an immune cell phenotype. And this immune cell phenotype can be used with broader implications um, to better understand how the tumors are behaving across different cancers. So this has been done as well in 2018. Uh, the over thousands, thousands of tumors were collected and profiled using these different deconvolution methods, and they were able to identify specific tumor sub immune subtypes. They classified the behavior of the tumor with respect to the immune system. And these subtypes were able to alter the prog predict the prognosis of the patient down the bottom right here um, and, and how they reacted to the immune system. And, actually were able to be targeted via immune therapy in some cases. So it was incredibly helpful in clarifying to understand the, how the immune system plays a role via gene expression. But really, people, people haven't really looked at protein, proteomics, and how proteomics can inform tumor deconvolution. And this is kind of striking uh, because, you know, most immune cells were actually identified by their protein markers. So, you know, an immunologist can tell you what specific proteins are expressed on different immune cell types. Um, so it makes sense to leverage proteomics data, which has a lot of protein measurements in them, to better deconvolve um, the patient tumors directly. And we have this data now as part of the um, Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're able to prove, we now have over a thousand different patient measurements across different cancer types. Uh, this resource paper is in, currently like in the last stages of press or review and will be released shortly but is the data that we want to leverage for this project. So really, you know, when we go to want to deconvolute, when we want to deconvolve these tumors, we're missing one thing, which is the absence of an algorithm that is measured with a gold standard. So uh, because no gold standard exists, this would be something like you take a, a known mix of cells and you measure their proteins individually, and then you mix them in different fractions, like 50% CD4 cells and 50% T cells, and you try to extract that information back. Um, we don't have that proteomics uh, gold standard, so we um, developed decomprolute to, to get around that. And decomprolute was built to be a computational benchmark to assess the quality of algorithmic deconvolution methods based on proteomic data. This then, getting around the need for a gold standard, we were able to um, develop other metrics in its place. So the requirements that we had, this is a lot of text, I apologize, was that we wanted to leverage CBTAC data. Part of the motivation for this project is that we had this great data and we wanted to put it to good use. And this was an excellent use case for you know, profiling all these patients is to build better algorithms. Uh, we wanted to allow for different and varying cell type signature matrices. I alluded to at the beginning that 
uh, the cyber sort paper released 22 different cell types, but a lot of other people have profiled specific population, subpopulations of tumors, and we wanted to be able to use those sig cell signature matrices as well. The third requirement was that it be really easy for someone to develop a new algorithm and plug it into the system. We didn't want to have um, you know, a lot of requirements that made it really challenging, so that you know, we wanted this to really fuel the development of new algorithms. And the last thing was that we wanted to, we were very careful about the metrics that we used to assess performance so that it would be easy for someone to plug in an algorithm or a signature matrix and assess the performance and use that going forward. Um, so part of the reason I'm here is that we were able to achieve all these requirements through the use of Docker containerization and the common workflow language. So we did this as follows. Uh, we, we took the CPTAC PanCan data set, which has been stored and put on box and actually exported via a Python package, but we containerized the Python package into individual Docker containers that explicitly exported the mRNA data and the protein data. And they did that by, uh, I think they did tumor type was one of the inputs and whether or not you wanted tumor or normal patient data, uh, sample data. So that there was a, a CWL tool for each, for both the mRNA data and protein data. These uh, refer to directories on the GitHub site if you're wondering why I have different text here. Uh, we also created a Docker container explicitly for the signature matrices. We implemented like four. I might have a fifth one that I added for fun on the GitHub site um, so that it, you, you were able to ask for a specific uh, signature matrix by name and get it exported in the proper format. We implemented and containerized four different algorithms uh, that have been published in the tumor deconvolution space, including CyberSort, which I uh, showed earlier on, um, that took these, um, that took a, um, an expression matrix, either protein or mRNA, as well as a signature matrix as input and output that predicted uh, cell type fractions that I showed earlier. And lastly, I apologize for the crowding here. Uh, we implemented three different metrics, uh, one that compared mRNA to protein, one that compared um, uh, measurements to data, simulated data, and the third that compared to those immune subtypes I talked about earlier. So now I'm going to walk through how these different metrics work to give you a sense of how we linked up the CWL and Docker. Um, I don't show all of the different workflows in those, in those pretty graphs. I apologize. But what I do show is um, first the command to run an example, which is on the GitHub IO site that I linked to earlier. Um, but you can also, if you're really patient, copy all of this. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the YAML file that we use for the mRNA versus protein data. And the reason why we do this mRNA versus protein is that um, mRNA deconvolution is currently the gold standard in deconvolution. So we thought that if we could find specific algorithms that agreed between protein and, and mRNA-based predictions of cell types, then we would know that that algorithm would be effective for proteins. So here we show, the, we just input two different cancer types here that we um, scatter across in the CWL workflow, as well as different algorithms, both run on protein data and mRNA. Uh, we only use tissue, tumor tissue, we don't use normal. Um, and then we use two different signature matrices. And this is sort of the top of the CWL um, workflow tool. I don't show the whole thing because it's pretty long, but you can go and check it out on the GitHub site if you're really curious. Uh, the result of this analysis, it takes a while to run all the different combinations, um, depending on your machine. Uh, but what it, you're able to do is look at the mean correlation by cell type and um, across different algorithms here. So you can see that um, we have, oh, my head is blocking part of this, but we essentially have for each mRNA-based run on the um, y-axis and protein-based run on the x-axis, we can see how well um, the two um, the different um, predictions based on mRNA and protein are agreeing based on their mean correlation. So the higher the correlation, the more in agreement the two algorithms, the two data sets are. And what you can see in this bottom right quadrant here is essentially that MCP counter and Excel both are highly consistent between mRNA-based measurements and protein-based measurements um, in that they don't seem to require as much as the data distribution that things like CyberSort require. Um, and that's more into the implementation of their algorithms, but suggests that these two algorithms are really robust and should be, um, will be really, um, uh, should be used on proteomic data. The second benchmark we did was the data simulation comparison, and this used simulated data from signature matrices that we know, and then we were able to compare how well these agreed with, with 
um, simulated fractions. So the results of this end up being uh, automatically generated PDFs that come out and tables that can show you how uh, the mean correlation of a particular cell type uh, with its simulated values so that we know that we've simulated 50% of the cells and if we get 50% back, that's a high correlation, for example. Um, so what this generally shows, it compares two signature matrices and shows that um, across most of the algorithms, this signature matrix performs better. Um, EPIC performs um, more poorly in, um, on the LM9 fractions here on these different cell types. Um, so it gives you a, a really granular set sense of where the algorithms are succeeding and failing, so you can improve your own algorithm. And lastly, we do the immune subtype comparison, uh, which was another um, suggestion we had from our working group. Um, and it's, so what it takes is those annotated immune subtypes from the Thorson paper that I showed earlier and um, predicts and gives you a sense of how the different cell types are distributed across the different subtypes. So here we have four of the subtypes that were predicted in the mRNA data. So we use the immune subtypes from the gene expression data, annotate each patient. And then for all of the patients that are assigned to wound healing, we look at the distribution of um, predicted cells based on algorithm here. So we have, you know, again, all of the wound healing is predicted to be pretty, you know, um, you know, we don't expect these patients to have a lot of immune cells, and they don't based on every algorithm. Um, so one of the, th the metrics, again, my head is blocking the important outcome here that we're kind of looking at with this is we're trying to understand, you know, which algorithms actually able to highlight the differences in immune subtypes based on the cells populations. And here is where, you know, Excel also kind of did the best, where it was able to predict immune hot um, a high fraction of immune cells and immune hot subtypes, which are basically the yellow and the green, and a low fraction of immune cells in patients that were not supposed to be immune hot, such as the red and the turquoise here. So you have to take my word for it because my large head is blocking the bottom right corner, but it is um, a value and uh, something that is another metric that we have in our toolbox. So that's really it for, for Decomp Relute. It's a pretty straightforward application, um, but what I wanted to kind of drive home with this talk is that, you know, it's one application of how, to, uh, and one way to use uh, containerization and workflows to really drive the benchmarking field forward. Uh, there's a lot um, of algorithms out there. I'm in the proteomics field now, and there's a lot of different tools that measure proteomics and very few benchmarks that exist um, that compare those algorithms, and if they do exist, they exist in the form of CSV data sets that you have to run and compare. So it's really hard to develop a new algorithm because it really puts the onus on the developer to really compare and measure. And, um, and then the onus on the reviewer to make sure that they're measuring against all of the correct algorithms. So through the standardization, standardization of data that the CPTAC uh, consortium did, that really made this process much easier because now we have a standardized data set. Uh, we have common APIs enabled by the containerization of all the algorithms. And then we have agreed upon metrics that we can use um, to create a, a valuable benchmark for uh, tumor deconvolution that I hope to have um, really expand this to other types of algorithms that are, I think are really lacking in the benchmarking space. Um, so I actually have a lot to say about benchmarking, but I'm not going to talk about that and just move on to my acknowledgement slide. Uh, this is a multi-institutional um, affair from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, um, Michele and Pietro from Italy, and Song, who's my colleague here at PNNL, who's done a lot of the work and the lead author on this project. And I think, you know, it's really, um, I'm really excited to be here and happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you. <laughs>